Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. I, I love that. Uh, anyway, I want to welcome you to Asbury United Methodist Church. I'm Tom Van Zant, the pastor here. It's great to be able to uh, to, be, to be able to worship with you. I left my stuff over here. Hey, uh, if you'll uh, look in the bulletin, it'll, uh, it'll have all the announcements of things we have to do. I do want to invite people to fill out the connection card and put that in the offering plate when it comes by uh, as a way of uh, acknowledging your presence with us. And um, um, we do have, a, I think we have one more week where if you'd like to, uh, to uh, purchase a, a lily, for the church, uh, for the, for uh, Easter, uh, where you can do that, and the order forms are in the back. A lot of uh, exciting things, a lot of ways of being, of service to to Jesus Christ. Um, the let me see, we do the Apostles' Creed and then we do the ringers, right? Yes, I just forgot to move the mic, so I was getting ready. Okay, okay. Well, we're gonna we're gonna remain seated. For the Apostles' Creed, this is a historic confession of the Christian faith. It, it's a way for us to uh, uh, to maintain our focus. I know that we we live biblically, but this is uh, the uh, the tradition of the church is to uh, to put down our beliefs in a creed that we confess together. So I invite you to join with me in this historic confession of the Christian faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, the Maker of heaven and earth and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. God, we pray for your Holy Spirit to be with us as we seek to um, live this creed in our life, uh, in our faith. We pray for that Holy Spirit as we seek to worship you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.
I am going to ask everybody to stand now as you uh, turn to your neighbor and extend the right hand of fellowship. I lost my folder. I didn't know what I was supposed to be doing. Will you stand? Sorry, you just sat down. Um, what a friend we have in Jesus. It will, the words will be on the screen.
them about prayer. You may be seated unless you're the children. Hey, God. Oh, look, you brought an Easter basket up here. 2.0 made you this. Hold on a sec. I want you to wait till everybody's up here, and then we're all going to face this way so everybody can see us. And then what do you, what do you say? Everyone in Arc 2.0 made you this for Easter. Oh, that's wonderful. And you didn't even hide it everywhere for me to find it. You're just going to give it to me. Yeah. You're going to what? Oh, can you hold that for a second? Well, thank you very much. That's, that's such a blessing. Look, it's a chocolate bunny. I haven't had one of those in years. I'll try to hide that from my children at home who are going <laughs> to visit this afternoon. Um, that's, that's cool. That's what, 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 what does it say? Play. Play. You know what? I, I was afraid that it might say play too because it's written in cursive, right? It says what? Pray. Pray, yes. It says this, is a, this R kind of looks like an L. But this is an R. Yes, yes, it is. Yes, Adonis, this is an R. <laughs> I guess, I guess, I guess uh, um, over at Hobby Lobby, they thought you could use it for either one. <laughs> but we're going to say it's pray. I think you're right. I think that's a, that's a cursive R. It's a little exaggerated. It's a little exaggerated, but um, they don't teach you cursive anymore in school, do they? Yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. Okay. Doesn't doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. We're going to say it's pray. Thank you very much. And and what are each of the letters? Can you spell it for me? Just tell me the letter. P R A Y. P R. She got it right. P R A Y. And we are in a study about about prayer, but we are using pray as an acronym. Can you do you know what an Acronym is? No, it is. Do, you, do you, anybody know? No, that is that is that is when you use a word and use each of the letters of the word to teach you something. Like what? Stem. St- yes, yeah, stem stands for something. What? I don't know. Nobody knows, but it's an acronym. That's the problem with acronyms. <laughs> like where it goes all the way down, and then you're right from. Yeah, something like that. So it's a, anyway. It, here it is. P R A Y. So got it. P is going to stand for pause. If you're going to pray, you need to stop. Right? What you're doing. Pause. R. Anybody want to guess what R is for? No. No. R is not for no. R is for rejoice. What does rejoice mean? What do you think? Be happy. Rejoice, I think rejoice means like regather because re equaled again. So again, rejoice. Yeah, yeah, we, 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 we rejoice again. That's right. So we rejoice. We are happy. Joyce being happiness, I guess. We're happy with God. We rejoice in what God's doing. Now, if you pray, the A one, A one's an easy one because if you pray a prayer, you ask. Ask, who do you ask when you pray? Who do you ask? Jesus. Jesus or God or somebody. Yeah, you ask. That's, a lot of times we pray, ask. And then the why is for yes or yield. So once you've prayed, then you say, yes, God, whatever happens, whatever your will is, be done. Isn't that, isn't that good? Do you like that? Let's say it with me. Are ready? P is what? Pause. R is rejoice, A is ask, and Y is yes. You guys did such a good job with that. Hey, did you know that we have a prayer room in this church upstairs on the second floor? I'm going to put this in the prayer room. Can you see it? Well, you can ask in 2.0 if you can take a field trip. Probably if you're really good and get everything done early, but I know Miss Nancy always has a lot for you guys to do. You guys do important things back there, like making baskets for people, Christmas stuff, and and it's such an important thing that you guys do. I really appreciate you being here to do that so that we can we can reach out with God's love and everything. Let's have, let's have a prayer. God, we are so thankful for your love and your grace. I'm thankful for these children and pray your blessing upon them, that they might walk in your word and your way.
that they might be able to pray the honest prayers of their hearts. Hear your answer and yield to your will. It's in your son Jesus Christ's name we pray. And all God's children said? Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. You can go to 2.0 now.
Friends, we come together in worship as, a, as an expression of the way God, um, uh, of all of the blessings and the many ways God has, has given to us and, and provided for us. And, and so we come to this time of offering as forgiven and reconciled people, bringing to God our tithes and ourselves. God, for the many blessings you've given us, the abundance in our life you've given us, we return a portion to you seeking your blessing for these offerings, for our lives, for the grace and the love and the peace you've given us that we might share with others. It's in your son Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Remain standing as we sing Spirit of the Living God and we're going to do it through two times.
That is gorgeous. You may be seated. The scripture this morning is John 11, 1 through 16. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sister sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death, rather it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, Though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after he said, then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you, and you were going there again. Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought he was referring merely to the sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I'm glad I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go, that we may die with him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, to, be God. to God. Amen. Thank you. The um, in the lectionary, the lectionary kind of uh, defines. Uh, it's a institutional way of defining what scriptures we should read uh, on which Sundays and how they lead up together. That's it's done. It's it's something that's been historical in the church for thousands of years, well, maybe not thousands, but hundreds of years. And, uh, and, and this reading, these readings in John are long readings, and we only really read half of it uh, going down through. I, I, we're going to explore some of the other parts of it as we, uh, as we talk this uh, today uh, about unanswered prayers. Now, back in our, our discussion group, I think some, there, there was a good point made that there really aren't any unanswered prayers. Sometimes we just don't like the answer, or we feel like God is a, a little long in answering, or we, you know, we haven't explored the answer. So there are a lot of theological uh, questions in that. But I, I, wanna, I want us to, to, to really look at it uh, today in terms of our our prayer acronym, uh, pause, rejoice, ask, and then kind of between ask and, and yield comes this unanswered prayer question. We talked about uh, petitionary prayers, those are the prayers that we ask, and the uh, intercessory prayers, those prayers where we pray for other people. Uh, we, we talked about that, but what happens when, when things don't work out exactly the way you think they ought to ask? Now, uh, when, when I, I, this is my Bible, but I, I frequently uh, use my book of worship, particularly when I'm doing funerals. And, and, and if you look in it, it's, it's filled with, um, with these memorial sheets. These are, these are memorial sheets from that. And I used to, used to take them out pretty regularly, and I, you know, I, I had a way of filing them. Uh, I kind of hate files. Files are where paper goes to die, is, is what, uh, what I think, because I, I rarely ever open a file up after I have um, had put it there. So I, I just got in the habit of just leaving them in there until they all uh, fall out. It, there's so much that that uh, that I remember from all of it, and so many, but they also represent prayers unanswered, don't they? Or prayers that I had answers 
I didn't, I didn't like. You know, I have a, I have Don O'Neill. He's um, he was he was the usher at one of my churches, and he was there every Sunday. And you know, he was like the kind of guy who'd who'd make sure everything went right. You know, he was kind of the behind the scenes guy, and uh, and he got sick, and we prayed for him, but he went on to be with the Lord. And um, of course, there's. Uh, Jackie, and Jackie was our, our children's director at a church I was at, and Jackie got diagnosed with, a, uh, later they found a, it was a stage four colon cancer, and, and we prayed for Jackie, and we had miracles that happened along the way, but um, she lived longer than anybody expected her to, but she eventually succumbed. And then uh, I have my, my friend Eric, Eric Moore. Eric was a pastor in the United Methodist Church. He was somebody who I knew. He was, um, he was 40, um, it makes him 40, uh, 39 years old when he passed away uh, just uh, from, uh, from COVID. Uh, certainly a prayer unanswered or a prayer that, that you feel like, God, really, would this have to happen? Now, um, um, uh, Yohali, uh, the the uh, our our friends who are from uh, the Congo, they that I, that was the oldest person I've ever done. We, we did that when we did that that service. She uh, she was a uh, 114 was your great grandmother, right? 114 years old and had just come to the United States and um, had had succumbed, and um, and then we have. Um, of course, out of our church, if you haven't heard, Virginia Salvog, she was our oldest member here at the church, almost 102, just a few weeks short of 102 years old. And, um, and we've been praying for her a lot, and she's had some miraculous recoveries, uh, but, but finally had succumbed and had gone on to be with the Lord uh, last night. Uh, Virginia was, uh, you know, she was, she was one of those people who was uh, always, always asking about the church. Always concerned about the church uh, uh, in Virginia. She's a, she, she's, she was, she was prepared. She's always ready. Uh, she was always ready. But we've been praying for her, and so sometimes you, you scratch your head and say, God, um, why is life so painful? Why is this all so difficult, always to go through? And so I want to talk. I want to just take. Uh, take a uh, this. I want to go through this scripture passage, but before I start, before I start, I want us to uh, to bow in prayer and uh, to God to invite your Spirit to be with us that as we explore your Word and your way. Um, we might see uh, what it means to be disciples of your Son Jesus Christ, and that we might have the heart and the desire uh, to go down that path. It's in your son Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. The, the, there's, this, there's this real theological dilemma. This is the, the theological dilemma that, that uh, many people bring up. That if, if God is so loving, if God is so uh, powerful, all powerful, just like in the Apostles' Creed we read, the creator of heaven and earth, uh, why is there so much pain and suffering? Why is there so much difficulty in the world? Can't God change everything. And so some of that is, is an address of that question that we go through today when we, when we look at this, uh, this last miracle of Jesus that John relates. Uh, John is much more, as I've said before, he's much more strategic about the way he puts his gospel together, the way he talks about the miracles of Jesus. He only mentions seven miracles. He elaborates quite a bit more on them. He, 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 every detail is important. Uh, every detail goes into something we could spend, we could spend a, a year exploring this passage. We won't. We're just going to do it here. And I didn't even have us read the whole thing because uh, long readings in church, I don't know, you guys are much better than I am. I, I've I've always had kind of a short attention span, and so uh, the long readings in church, I, I get, I, I, my brain's going way off over here, and I don't hear all of it today, but I do want to explore this. Uh, why most unanswered prayers, um, why most unanswered prayers can be attributed to what? It's one of those dot, dot, dots that I like uh, to put on the, uh, on the screen. Most unanswered prayers can be attributed to, and what we can learn from this scripture passage uh, about that. Now, this comes straight out of that book, 
um, how to pray that we've been studying in Sunday school and on Wednesday Wednesday evening and maybe you've been uh, looking at on your own and and certainly the video five I think is one of my one of them that, that has just so much in it uh, but this comes kind of straight out of Pete Griggs uh, book as it, as it goes across there. not using these scripture passages but in uh, it's a biblical principle and so you can apply it many different ways and we start with the the first verse, uh, ver- chapter 11, verse 1, uh, where, where kind of is the setting. Now a certain man was ill. Now, now that, that already starts and, and tells us kind of what we need to know. Things aren't right. Illness and sickness are about things not being exactly right. If you've been or suffer with an illness or suffer with an affliction or something, and most of us do and have, sometimes it's worse, sometimes it's other, you know, this is not the way things are supposed to be. Something's, something's amiss, if you will. And it was Lazarus of Bethany. Bethany, in the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Now he goes on to explain who Mary, and, uh, who Mary is anyway, that she's the one who uh, washes Jesus' feet with her, with her hair. It, it, there are a number of Marys in the Bible. It gets a little bit confusing. Uh, as far as I know, there's only one Martha mentioned. Now most of us, I don't know about you, my, I mostly think of that story of Martha and Mary when Jesus comes to visit and Martha is in the kitchen getting everything ready. Martha is the one who's doing everything to make sure that hospitality is set. And Mary's the one who's sitting at Jesus' feet, right? She's the one listening to Jesus. And, and kind of Jesus sides with Mary on it. Martha, and Martha's like, you know, Jesus, she really needs to get up and do something too. <laughs> there, that's, that really uh, could be a sermon in and of Well, it is a sermon in and of itself. Um, But these are Jesus' friends. These are Jesus' supporters. These are the people who are on board with this Jesus movement. And and Lazarus is ill. And and we know that Jesus teaches a lot of things. Uh, Mary was listening to teachings and everything. But Jesus' teaching uh, isn't just about words in the air. Jesus' teaching are about actions in our lives and miracles that happen, Right? So here's somebody who's really connected. Here's somebody who's really uh, installed in this system. Here's somebody who really, uh, who's prominent in the, in, in what's going on. And he lives in Bethany, which is close to Jerusalem. And, and everybody knows who he is and how important he is to this Jesus movement. And so right away you have this expectation that Jesus is going to go over there and heal Lazarus. Uh, but as you read down through that, uh, Jesus finds out he's sick, and he doesn't go right away. He waits two more days. Sometimes we get a little impatient. With God. I don't know, maybe you don't, but I get a little impatient with God. I, I, I need God to act now on my timeline, and, uh, and, and so often God works in God's Timeline. There's a biblical principle that we need to always start with, and, and, and that is that, that, that we live in a broken world. So most unanswered prayers can be attributed, first of all, to God's world, the way God created the world. And that, that we know from biblically that it gets messed up right away and that that we that that's the one part that we can look at and see and and nobody argues with the the biblical principle there and and the truth of the matter is it's perfect for the first three chapters and then the whole rest of it is the messed up part there are thousand you know my my bible has a 1500 pages of messed up part and how we put it back together and it and that in the midst of it, there's this struggle and there's this wrestling with, with life and with God. And, and we wonder what's going on. But the Bible is so honest about all of it. It's so honest about how, about how difficult sometimes the journey can be and how, how life sometimes can be tough. And, then, and there, there's that question of how we respond to it. But biblically, biblically, we can look at what, what's going on. And, and when we, we skip down to verse 6, 
Skip down to verse 6. Uh, he says, After having heard Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Jesus isn't going immediately. Is that, is that how you respond to the biggest giver of your church? <laughs> I could hear it now. <laughs> Not here at Asbury, but at some other church they would say that. Is that how you respond to the most faithful people? Do you not at least drop everything and show up? But Jesus has a purpose. Jesus is here for one. Now, one of the things we know is that death in this life has not been removed, right? Even Lazarus isn't work, walking around. It may make a good movie, but he isn't walking around anymore. Our physical bodies will give out. We will succumb to this world and what's going on. And that's the question is, what is going on here? Well, first of all, first of all, the world is broken. That's our first point, our first biblical point. The second thing is, most on their answer prayer can be attributed to God's war. Human beings are the traitors. Human beings are the ones who, who turned their back on God. That's what we said in the beginning. And, and created, and, and God could have walked away. But instead, God chose to enter into this conflict with this world, and sometimes this conflict with us. That we are in a spiritual war. One of the things that we acknowledge is that we're people who are, who are beyond our physical. There's something more to us, a soul that is put together and that's somehow fractured and broken and that God promises to put that back together. But it's, not, it's like any surgery. It's like any rehabilitation. It's like any growth you have. It is difficult and tough. And the spiritual therapy is just as hard as physical therapy. Maybe we're not as mean here at the church in putting you through that spiritual therapy. Or maybe sometimes we are. But we're in the midst of a spiritual war that's going on. And this is what, and, and, and Jesus is patient in the middle of it. Why is Jesus so patient about it? Because he knows the end of the story. He's read the end of the book. If you know how things come out, you have more confidence. You can step forward with what's going on. And so, so here, here they do. They're, they've got this, you know, they, they go back and forth. And I, I, love, I love the gospel. I love Thomas. I love Thomas all the time. He's going to show up. He shows up that week after Easter too, where, where everybody sees, everybody sees Jesus uh, you know, every, everybody sees Jesus, but Thomas wasn't there. And so Thomas is like, I'm not believing it until I touch the side and I touch his fingers. I'm not believing anything you guys say anymore. And Thomas is the one looking like, you know, we're really going back toward Jerusalem. Those people want to kill us. That's what he's saying. So we may as well go with, we may as well go with Jesus and die with him. It's better that we die together. That's not what I'm going to be preaching today. <laughs> You're okay. I'm not asking everybody to die together here. <clears throat> let's, let's, you know, let's lift the... But here's what happens. They go there and Lazarus has died. He is in the grave. Mary runs out and, you know, Mary kind of has this backhanded thing of like, you know, Jesus, if you were here, this wouldn't have happened. And, and then they get that, that passage that, you know, when they say you have to memorize a passage in the Bible, everybody wants to do that passage in this, in this 11th chapter of John, Jesus wept. <laughs> Everybody's moved so much, even Jesus cries. And then he says, where is he? And he says he's in the tomb. It's like somehow God is changed right here. Jesus is changed. Oh, it, it's kind of fascinating. The, the first miracle in John, 
well, Jesus doesn't really want to do it. He goes to that wedding at the Feast of Cana of Galilee. His mom's already there, and Jesus shows up, and by the time Jesus gets there, there's no more wine. And, and, and Mary, Jesus' mother Mary, says, ah, I know what. He says, hey, Jesus, they're out of wine. <laughs> and Jesus is like, mom? He goes, actually says, actually says, woman, what is that to me? And that's when Mary slaps him across the side of the head. No, we are not advocating violence. That's not in the Bible. <clears throat> she wants to build his self-esteem. No, he doesn't really necessarily want to. He turns that water into wine. And here he is. He's got a plan. He's, he's talking about the resurrection and the hope and all that that goes on. And, and they're like, but, but what about now? And Jesus, it's like, it's like he cries and he's, I don't know whether he's changed or not, but you can kind of see it. It's sort of this cinematic thing where they, he takes them, they take them down to the tomb and, they, and they're like, this isn't a good idea. This is not a great miracle. That this, this guy's been in the tomb for, a, you know, for days. He's not going to smell good. I mean, there's always a practical thing to all miracles, right? It's not, this isn't going to smell good. And Jesus said, roll away the stone. And in that dramatic moment in the Bible, he, he yells, he yells, Lazarus, come out! And a miracle happens there. The miracle that ripples through everywhere. Jesus, Jesus doesn't turn around to the other crowd. Now, now go tell everybody that the, the guy in the, with the, you know, he's all wrapped up like a mummy, the way, and, he, and he wanders out of the tomb. And he doesn't, Jesus doesn't turn around and say, now go tell everybody what I've done. Now, when Jesus does a miracle, you know what the weird thing about the Bible is? When Jesus does these miracles, most of the time he says, don't tell anybody. That miracle is between you and God. But what Jesus knows is you can't help but to tell somebody. You're a changed person. You can't help but to see that Lazarus has been changed from death to life. So the last verse in this pericope, there's a good, there's a good uh, biblical word for it. That is this story in the Bible. Verse 44. The dead man, we know who the dead man is. Who is it? Lazarus came out. His hands and feet are, banned with, uh, are bound with strips of cloth, and his face is wrapped in cloth. And Jesus said to them, did he say, go tell, he says, hey, go tell everybody what happened here. <laughs> did Jesus turn around and say, wow, look what I could do. Did, he, did Jesus run up there and hug him? No, he says to him, what does he say to him, friends? Read the words Jesus says, unbind him and let him go. You see, we know we live in a world that's broken. We know we're in the midst of a spiritual battle. And the third, go ahead, that next slide, Rob. And we're, you know, it's about God's world, and it's about God's war, but it's also about God's will. Ultimately, everything needs to glorify God and center around what God is doing. And that what, what's the great commandment? To love God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Love God, love others. Serve the world. God's will here is for the community to come around and to remove and to be supportive and to remove those bandages and to be ready. Virginia, I was over, I was visiting, I had that, uh, I had heard that Virginia had, didn't have long, and I was over visiting with her nephew, and her daughter was in, there's a number of miracles there. Wednesday, Thursday service, you don't want to miss it. Um, Virginia, there are pages. He says, she's planned her funeral, and he, he picks up, but there must be 10 typewritten pages of what's going to happen. 
Whenever I visited with Virginia, she says, I am ready to go. I am ready for God to take me. And she was not just spiritually, but in this world. Every, they said, everything's planned. We just need to set the time and the place. Even had music for the choir to sing. <laughs> Virginia sung in the choir for years. She was ready. Are we all ready? Are we ready physically? I mean, do we have all those things set up in our lives and all that? Are we ready spiritually? Because we live in God's world. We're in the spiritual battle. And sometimes there are casualties in the midst of it. But what we want to be able to do is live out God's will for our life. Now, that's a, that's a hard sermon. Because I'd love to be able to sit up here and preach the sermon and says, you know, if you pray to God, it's just going to happen the way you think. But the way our God works is that we need to grow. God wants us to grow into the kind of people that God want, needs us to be and wants us to be, the way we were originally created to be. And it just gets messier and messier through the Bible until you get to that last book of the Bible, which is the messiest one of them all. And then at the end, Jesus is victorious. We're stepping through the Lenten season, the season of spiritual growth, when we ponder these things, when we think about these things. Because next week is Palm Sunday when we celebrate Jesus' triumphal entry, but right after that, we go through the passion of Christ through Holy Week. And you don't want to miss the Good Friday service. It's it's the, service, it's the service that you need to be at to really think about what Jesus has done so that you can really understand how wonderful, what the victory is of Easter. So I don't know what your stumbling block is in doing all that. I don't know what the difficulty is. But I'm going to offer a prayer and know that you're welcome if, if that's a an ailment or a difficulty or some prayer that you just you don't feel like God is answering or is feel like God's, you, you don't know whether so, there's a greater distance between you and God. You need some growth or you need some respite. Know that you're welcome always, anytime during the service to come to the chancel rail, but particularly during the prayer time. So I'm going to lead us in that pastoral prayer. And then uh, at the end of the pastoral prayer, I'm going to invite you to pray the Lord's Prayer with me. And if you'd like prayer for yourself or for others, you're welcome to come up and, and we'll have a brief prayer. I invite you to turn with me as we go to God in prayer. God, you truly are the creator of all things, the redeemer of all things, the sustainer of all things. We bow before you. We bend the knee of prayer, of hope, and of faith. We come here confessing our sins, knowing that we have not always done the things we ought to have done, and that sometimes we've done things we shouldn't have. We come here giving ourselves over to the mercy of your Son, Jesus Christ, confessing Him as our Lord and Savior, knowing that He accepts us just exactly who we are, where we are, who sends the Holy Spirit to us fills us up and seeks to, seeks to make us amazing, holy, perfect. Now we come with our own difficulties, our own stumbling blocks. We've experienced loss in our life. 
We've been embittered by things that have happened that we don't understand. We're weary from the spiritual battles that rage around us. And our temptation is to to draw in, to embrace the anger and anxiety and bitterness. But we know with your healing touch, we know that, that you call to us to come out of our tombs and to enjoy a life that doesn't just last on this earth, but goes for eternity. So God, we give thanks for the many people who help unbind us, for the many things in this world that help us see the hope and the light. And we pray that we can embrace it We can celebrate it. We can share it. As we seek to be disciples of your Son, Jesus Christ, praying the prayer that he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If you're able, will you stand as we sing, Alas, and did my Savior bleed?
Friends, never forget that God created this world. You live in God's world. And that in the midst of it, we're in a spiritual battle. We are fighting God's war. But that God loves you and cares for you. And that ultimately, God wins the ultimate victory through God's will. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.